Greetings, everyone, and welcome to City Lights Live, the official online version of the City Lights Bookstore Events Calendar. I'm your host, Peter Maravallis, and tonight, City Lights and Liver Right Books celebrate the publication of Before the Movement, The Hidden History of Black Civil Rights. It is authored by the prize-winning scholar Dylan C. Penningroth and published by Liver Right Books. It is an important new book that explores a hitherto little-known subject, drawing upon an extraordinary amount of research based on long-forgotten sources before the movement demonstrates how Black people use the law to their advantage long before civil rights. The rights of everyday use, that is known in legal circles, paved the way for the modern version of civil rights before the movement recovers a vision of Black life allied with, yet very, very distinct from the freedom struggles of the previous century. Before we begin, I'd like to take this moment, as is customary before each event, to acknowledge that we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ramatishalini peoples. We would like to take this moment to offer respect to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. So we are delighted and honored to have with us tonight Dylan C. Penningroth in conversation with Richard Thompson Ford. They will be exploring the subject of this important new book. Dylan C. Penningroth is a professor of law and history at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship and author of the award-winning book, The Claims of Kinfolk. He makes his home in Kensington, California. Richard Thompson Ford is the George E. Osborne Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. He writes for both scholarly and popular audiences and is published in newspapers and journals such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, amongst others. His writing has also appeared in such journals as the Harvard Law Review, the Stanford Law Review, and uh, others. Uh, he's the author of the critically acclaimed book, Dress Codes, How the Laws of Fashion Made History. Two of his other books were selected as notable books of the year by the New York Times. These include The Race Card and Rights Gone Wrong. He's appeared on the Colbert Report, the New York Radio Hour, and All Things Considered. Such a great honor to have you both with us here tonight. Welcome to City Lights. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for having me too, and for hosting a conversation about such a terrific book, a, a rich social history. I can't wait to delve into all of the nuance of this, of this topic. And you know, maybe I'll just start off, Dylan, by Noting that you know, when most people see a book about the Black civil rights struggle um, or Black civil rights, a few things are going to come to mind. And those are, we're either going to talk about slavery and the law with respect to slavery, Reconstruction and the broken promises of Reconstruction, or uh, the heroic civil rights struggle of the mid 20th century. And of course, your book is about all of those things, but it's about so much more. You tell a, a, a much less well-known story about the relationship between African-Americans and the law. Uh, maybe you could just start by telling us a little bit about how you got started on this project and how the story that you're telling differs from that conventional narrative that most people are familiar with. Sure. Well, first, I just want to say thank you for for being here and, uh, you know, for being my conversation partner in this. It is a real honor uh, to do this together with you. And thanks to City Lights. Thank you to to Peter for getting this all together. Um, you know, the I think you're absolutely right. This the what you described just now is what I think of as um, the traditional story of African-American history. This field is often um, told as a kind of long freedom struggle, that is, from slavery to freedom. That was actually the title of one of the great early works of African American history by John Hope Franklin. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is because African American history has, since it since its inception, has always been engaged in a kind of politics, trying to uh, document the achievements of African-Americans in the past, uh, trying to sort of show their worth for citizenship. And beginning in the 1960s, you see African-American scholars coming into universities like Yale and Berkeley and self-consciously positioning themselves as continuing their activism through scholarship. Mm -hmm. And so that is 
a long and important and illustrious tradition in the field of African-American history. But there have been costs to that. And, you know, one of those costs, I think, is that it tends to um, uh, take our attention away from vast swaths of Black life that don't really fit into the freedom struggle narrative. And so, you know, I can just name one off the top of my head, but there, there are many that I talk about in the book. And we might think about um, old age care. What happens to people when they get old? Now, obviously, this is an enormous story. But the, the first thing that I realized when I discovered this case that led me down that particular path, Stewart versus Jefferson, in the Washington, D.C. National Archives, is that pretty much everyone involved in this case was African-American. It was uh, a Black woman uh, who had been born in slavery and in her old age had moved to Washington, D.C. and uh, had accumulated enough property that she was able to leave some to the person she loved or the people she loved. Instead of leaving it to her biological kin, she left it to her best friend's daughter. And things went on and suddenly her biological kin showed up and sued. And when I started looking at this case, I realized that there's this story that is really important to um, to Eliza Brown, to Henrietta Jefferson and Euphemia Stewart, the three principal people who are involved in this case, but it doesn't fit the freedom struggle narrative. And it's not something that you run across very much in the field of African-American history. The other thing that I, I noticed early on in reading these cases is that law really mattered. So I guess if there are sort of two uh, sort of lead off points that I would make, it's that Black people's relationships with one another are the heart and soul of the story that I want to tell. And then the second one is that law really matters, not just as a symbol, um, not just as a, a goal to aspire to, but as something that Black people used every day in their lives to achieve the things that they wanted. That's the story I'm trying to tell. Yeah, so it cuts against a... Typical conception where the law is something that's alien to and hostile to African Americans for most of American history, at least until, you know, again, the civil rights movement in the, in the um, mid 20th century. Uh, but instead, you're telling a story where the property dispute that you just described is the kind of thing that I could easily imagine having taught students in a first year property class um, with out reference to race or the racial justice struggle at all. It's a, just a property dispute involving, um, you know, involving a, a family and a bequest that surprised the, a, a lot of people in the family. But um, so there's that, the, the idea that there's a whole story to be told of African-American history that doesn't always involve an oppressive white presence. And the law played an important role in that. So part of in part of the book, you talk about the way um, African Americans used law, or at least things like law, even during the time of slavery, and then moving forward um, into Reconstruction at a time when, indeed, the legal system was quite hostile to Black interests. Still used. The law. I mean, maybe you could tell us a little about some of those examples, and um, then I'll just throw in one one other question, which is your your method, like how you you talked about going into the archives, and I'm fascinated in how you found some of these uh, sources and what your method was for uh, unearthing them, and also for determining when the plaintiffs were black and when they weren't. Sure. No, it's a great question. I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll answer. Um, uh, the first part, and then maybe you can bring me back to the methods question, because I think that that is actually a really interesting story all in itself. Um, but, you know, law as an oppressive system, uh, it was and it still is in many respects. And so um, the first thing that I had to figure out for myself is 
which parts of this thing that we call the law were relatively open to African Americans' participation and which parts were relatively closed. Mm -hmm. So I'm not actually challenging certain parts of the freedom struggle narrative. So voting rights, you know, mm -hmm. my my great great uncle, uh, you know, I he's Jackson Holcomb. I talk about him in the first mm -hmm. couple of pages of the book. He uh you know, his voting rights are under attack, uh, you know, during his adult life. He's living in a world where the people who make the laws, the people who administer the laws, the people you meet at the county courthouse, they're all white and they're almost all men. And they are pretty much hostile to the idea of a black person voting, uh, participating in politics. Um, they're hostile to the idea of a black person socializing with them, except under very restricted circumstances. Um, so segregation is the norm. But there are certain parts of law that were relatively open to black people, not only during the worst days of Jim Crow, but even during slavery, which was a time when black people didn't even have rights. So the story that that I go back to when I think about how did I get interested in, in this topic, and I think what was the first thing that kind of hit me, I think it was a story that I heard growing up about my great-great uncle Jackson Holcomb, who was enslaved in uh, Southern Virginia in a place called Cumberland County. And I'd heard you know about Cumberland County all the time growing up, it's where our family was from. And uh, the story that I heard, which was actually recorded on tape, luckily for me in the 70s by my uncle, is that Jackson Holcomb had a boat. And toward the end of the Civil War, the Confederate Army was defeated at the Battle of Richmond and they're fleeing through the woods. They come upon my great great uncle Jackson Holcomb with his boat and they get passage across the river. He takes them across the river. And then when they get to the other side, his son says, the soldiers paid him. So I had heard that story a couple of times. And then at some point, it hit me. There's something really strange going on. Um, it sounds as though the soldiers who are heavily armed, who could have taken whatever they wanted right at that moment, it sounds as though they were treating Jackson Holcomb as if he had rights of property and rights of contract. They made a deal, right? He took them across the river in exchange for a promise to carry. And he had a boat. And so that got me thinking, what does it mean if a slave has property? Uh, what does it mean if a slave has is making contracts or things that look like contracts? And that made me want to know something more about slavery, but more importantly, or just as importantly, it made me want to know something about the world of law in which such things were possible. So that really kind of set me off on a path. And what it led me toward, first and foremost, was a realization that the world that Jackson Holcomb lived in until he was in his 20s during slavery was a world where enslaved people could have privileges but not rights. And enslaved people's privileges could not be defended in a court of law. You know, someone, had, the soldiers had taken the boat, there's nothing he could have done in court. But the fact that they didn't take it from him, the fact that they did pay him, suggests to me that there's something about the word privilege, there's something about the category privileges that meant something, not just to him, but to millions of white Southerners who dealt with people like Jackson Holcomb all the time and reading from other sources clearly respected the privileges of slaves. And it sounds like an oxymoron. It, it, it's like, what, what does that mean, the, the privileges of slavery? Well, you know, for the most part, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot, but in these limited circumstances, it means everything. Yeah, and you gave all of these fascinating examples of 
uh, slaves who, you know, effectively uh, made contracts for their labor outside, you know, that they had the privilege to make, um, keep a certain amount of their labor for themselves. And then they sold that and kept things for themselves or a certain amount of property where they could sell things. Um, you know, and again, they couldn't have gone to court to enforce any of this. But uh, one of the things that I found fascinating was that as I read the book, my first reaction was to say, this was a is a book about contradictions. It's a book about the way there's a contradiction between the idea that this group of people didn't have rights or that they were dealing with a hostile legal system or white supremacist society, and they certainly were, but they also were able to evoke the law at various moments. Um, and and the ta my task was to figure out how to manage the contradictions. But by the end of the book, I thought it wasn't really contradictions. It was, um, a, you know, it was a story where if you inhabited the, the 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 mindset of the time, it made perfect sense to a white judge, for instance, that he would never consider allowing a black person to vote, but he might consider enforcing a contract. Um, that the black person had signed it. Those two things weren't contradictory. Um, and at the same time, it wasn't contradictory that you might not be able to go to court to sue for something, but that most of the legal system for everybody operates without people going to court. That for the most part, people make good on their contracts, they fulfill their promises, they respect property because they, you know, without you having to sue, and so all of that was operating and there was a logic of the law that was governing people's lives, even if they couldn't always evoke the formal law. I, thought, I found that a fascinating through line of the book. I think that's right. And it, it, it really kind of lines up, just as you said, with most of our experience of law. Most of us don't go to court, uh, you know, and if we do go to court, we don't go to court all the time unless we're litigators you know but but we do deal with law we use law we think about law from time to time sometimes we do it without really thinking about it consciously mm -hmm. um and i think that all of us you know adults at least we have this sort of modicum of common sense that's partly about law like you can sort of predict what might happen if mm -hmm some dispute that you had with a neighbor got into court that you might not be an expert but you kind of know when it's time to call in the experts that's something that i found going through the sources that i consulted again and again is that black people during jim crow during the early civil rights movement they they often thought much the same way we did and the part that you mentioned about being a book of contradictions, I, I sometimes think of the book that way too. And then I guess kind of like you, I often think of it as being a book uh, of convergences. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think the work of the great critical race theorist, Derek Bell, mm -hmm. was uh, someone who I encountered um, at various points along the way, not because he's in the sources, but because I was reading alongside, you know, trying to learn something about this, uh, the theories behind uh, critical race theory. And one of the things that he wrote was this thing called interest convergence. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, his theory, when he was writing, he was talking about the the progress towards civil rights in the 1950s and 60s, trying to explain when civil rights or why civil rights progress was made and coming up with theory of a general theory of when it's likely to be made. And his theory was that it's likeliest to occur when the interests of Black people in advancing civil rights converge with some interest held by a lot of white people. So if it serves white people's interests, then it's going to go forward or it's more likely to go forward. That, I thought, worked really well as mm -hmm. a way to understand what I was seeing in these sources. So why would a white judge, some of these judges, they're ex-Confederate soldiers, mm 
so one of the judges, uh, this guy named John Couture in Clarksdale, Mississippi, some white man accused him of having a black ancestor somewhere along the way, and Couture went out and shot him dead. So these are not these are not like cause lawyers. They're not pro-black, <laughs> right? And yet, over and over again, they uh, when they're judges, they entertain claims by black people, mostly against other black people, but sometimes against white people. They represent black people in court. Um, and they do things that I think seem surprising to us today, uh, but maybe because in order to understand them, we need to put ourselves back into that world and figure out like, why would a white person do this particular thing and not that thing? Why would they entertain black people's property rights and not even think about them having voting rights, much less uh, the right to marry a person of a different race. Mm. Yes, yes. So um, there's a, and, and this reminds me when you mentioned marriage, um, there's some really interesting inflection points in the book uh, involving marriage, yeah. where um, you, the first one involves people who, uh, after emancipation, had been living in conditions that one might describe as marriage and who be, probably considered themselves married, but under the law at the time during slavery, they couldn't be married. Uh, and so what happens after emancipation? Are they married or not? And how does the court deal with that? And that was an interesting set of inflection points where the relationship between um, custom and what we might describe as common law marriage and then formal marriage um, converged. And a lot of the questions that you're talking about, you know, this interest convergence idea, when was it that it was in the interest of, um, if not an individual judge, but maybe the, the system to recognize these marriages, but they struggled with that. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of those disputes. No, it's a terrific question. And, and actually, um, I was inspired at various points in pursuing this line of inquiry by the work of Tara Hunter, a historian at Princeton who just a few years ago published a fabulous book about the history of black marriage. And, um, you know, one of the things that she shows is just what you described, that the end of slavery, you know, it creates all sorts of, um, of difficulties for people. For white Southerners, the difficulty that it created in their minds was that, um, Black people no longer had masters. And if they didn't have masters, then they would supposedly descend into licentiousness. Um, they, they would have a whole bunch of children, and then the men would not provide for those children. And then the, the good white taxpayers of Mississippi and Virginia would have to make up the difference. And mm -hmm. so there's this kind of very modern sounding rhetoric mm -hmm. among white politicians of the 1860s as black people are uh, freed from slavery. And so what they'd they do, be dads, yeah. they'd be dads, exactly. And so often what they do is they pass these laws that basically say, if you were living together as husband and wife on a certain day, like January 1st, 1866, then you're married, legally married and all the obligations attached. So if you go and leave, then you can be sued for desertion, child support. So this is kind of a way for the state to, um, to try to seize control back over black marriage, to discipline black people back into marriage. But the other thing that happens, and this is something that I really have thought a lot about, is that um, the other problem that emancipation um, poses for white politicians is that it takes apart the labor force. So not only is mm -hmm. there not a master anymore to uh, keep black people married, but there's no longer going to be gangs of slaves working in the fields. And so over the first few years of emancipation, they kind of experiment with different ways of organizing labor. Mm 
And it's always this constant negotiation with Black people who are resisting as best they can um, any attempt to force them back into plantation labor. They want independent, they want to be independent farmers for the most part. Um, but what ends up happening effectively is that the landowners, the white former slave owners, eventually land on the Black family as the unit of labor control. So they they uh, they designate one head of household mm -hmm. and that head of household is going to be responsible for the you know the the activities and and duties of all the people, the children, the children, his wife, um, and it's almost always a man unless it's a single woman. And so what law ends up doing in the late 1860s is it's creating a kind of black patriarchy hmm. and what you see is that some black men step willingly into that role they become patriarchs they embrace it and they try to boss the labor of their wives and of their children hmm. and you see married black women pushing back against what men are trying to do to them and you see even children, teenage children, pushing back, uh, saying, my father, treat." there's a, a story that mm -hmm. comes much later, my father treated me like a slave when I was a mm -hmm. child. Clarence Thomas, as late as the, the 1980s, publishes a book in which he describes his own grandfather as treating him like a slave. So there's this kind of patriarchal story that runs through, and it's empowered by law but law is also what gives women and and children some of the tools that they need to fight back and one of the main things that women use to fight back is divorce mm -hmm. and so that 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 is one of the main cases that comes out of the sources that i'm reading like if there's one sort of archetype case if you just count up the numbers of the cases that i that i read the number one case is going to be divorce and i think that's no accident mm. it's because of this long negotiation you could even call it a struggle over legalized black patriarchy wow so yeah and it's such a story that we don't typically hear or think about this conflict within the black community around um, patriarchy and the role of well, the, the the role of family law. So we think of family law typically as something that's you know kind of separate from the economy, and it's about the relations, you know, private relations. And and, and yet in this instance, as I think is true in most instances, actually, um, family law is very much about the economy, and it's about how the economy is organized. And so family law becomes an extension of or um, a, a substitute for organizing the labor labor economy um, in the void left after uh, emancipation. It's just fascinating. Um, one of the, I, I wonder, I mean, do you have a story about a divorce that is particularly compelling you want to tell us about? Because the, I, that, that whole through line is just really interesting. Yeah, actually there, there is one story. There, there are many stories. Yeah. Um, but there, there's one that I think gets at um, this story of patriarchy. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think, it, it, it comes out of Washington, D.C. Um, and there, there's a husband and wife. Um, the husband is a minister uh, and he goes to court and sues for divorce, claiming that his wife kicked him out of the house and put his satchel on the curb. Um, and, you know, he he's, he says, I'm a minister, and my congregation expects me to behave as a minister ought to. And he brings in witnesses who claim that she was taking in boarders. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the woman who uh, kicked him out, Lucy Freeman, was allegedly taking in boarders, kicked him out. Reverend Edward Freeman, he goes and brings witnesses who say that 
um, that she may have been doing shenanigans with these borders. Mm -hmm. She never appears in court. There's a letter from her, which is very rare. And in the letter, she says, essentially, I'm glad that you're asking for a divorce because things have been cold in our marriage. And if it hadn't been for this, it would have been would have been something else. Um, but then she also says something really interesting that um, that I'm not the one who needs to fear God in this circumstance. If anyone needs to be fearing God, it's you, Reverend Freeman. And then she never appears in court. And I've often wondered why she didn't file an answer, given all the almost scurrilous things that Edward and his witnesses are saying about her. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because she knew that if she went, she'd be opening herself up to the most horrible racial stereotypes. Um, this is a time, 1885, when you know magazines and newspapers are routinely printing pictures of black people eating watermelons having you know children out of wedlock it's just a, a, an age of horrific racial stereotyping much of it built around black sexuality mm -hmm. and supposedly licentious black family life and i think that um lucy freeman knew that if she went there she would have to sit and listen to the worst kind of poisonous racist vitriolic discourse coming out of the mouth of a man she used to love and that she would be exposing her marriage to even deeper probing and i think given that choice she chose not to appear and that's something that happened again and again in these divorce cases you see one party come and the other party chooses not to show up and i think you know, one of the reasons that that happened is because they knew the world in which they lived. So we were talking earlier about the significance of race in this book. And what I try very hard to put Black people at the center of the story, and I'm decentering the story of race relations. So race relations is not the center of the book. It's not a story about how Black people fought against white oppression, how they overcame adversity. That, I think, is kind of a box that Black history has been put into, mm -hmm. a story of like simple, ordinary heroes overcoming adversity. But at the same time, race really matters at various points. It's sort of the backdrop. And so for me, like the, the trick has often been, the, the challenge has been to figure out when and how it matters. And that has not always been predictable, it, it, including in the way that it shows up in the sources themselves. Yeah, well, maybe that's a, a great segue back into an earlier question. How did it show up in the sources themselves? How did you conduct your research and how did you determine when a particular case involved Black litigants and when it didn't? Because that wasn't always stated, was it? That's right. It was almost never stated. Uh, was, I, I would go. So my typical research operation was I would get in the car at the time I lived in Chicago and I would drive south down I-57 and I'd end up in Edwardsville or Jacksonville, Illinois, and I'd keep going south to Cairo um, and then into Mississippi. And each each county, I would go to county courthouses. I'd go to the county seat and I would go in i'd introduce myself and tell them you know i'm a historian i work at northwestern i'm doing african-american history and i'm trying to find these cases um can i look at your old docket books do you have any mm -hmm. and so there's this really interesting moment you know when you're in the courthouse it's not an archive uh, that that mm -hmm. realization hits you very early on. Their job is not to serve you the way that an archivist's job is to serve you. They're kind of there to process traffic tickets and land transactions, and they're really busy with that. The vast majority of the time, they were incredibly helpful. They basically turned me loose and back. And what I found on those back shelves is you, you see these big, big shelves full of big, big ledger books called dockets. And they are records of summaries of the cases that were filed in that county court over time. 
So I would go in and I'd pull down the case book for the year 1892. And I'd look through and I'd start looking for cases involving black people. And, you know, very early on, I realized there, there don't seem to be any black people in these cases. And yet I knew from some of my earlier research that they must have been there. So what I ended up doing is I would uh, copy down or take pictures of these docket book pages. Then I and my research assistants, and I had an incredible, incredible uh, group of research assistants over the years, we would copy down the names into Ancestry.com. So this is the big, you know, mm -hmm. this is the company. It's run by the Mormons. And most of us probably know it is the place where you can find out by sending a swab of your DNA from inside your cheek. You can find out whether you have 17% Irish ancestry or, or, or something like that. But Ancestry also is... Uh, a company that has digitized the U.S. census for every decade going back to 1790. What that means is that you can search individual people by name, and that's what we did. We did it for uh, 14,000 cases, which is about 28,000 names. Uh, and um, of those 14,000 cases, we were able to get matches on uh, about 8,000 of them, and 1,500 of them involved African-Americans. And that's that's kind of a big number, given, as you said, that most of the time when we think of Black people in the law, we think of it as being this alien space, this oppressive force in Black life, this thing that if you were a Black person in Mississippi in 1900s, that is the last place you would want to go is to the county courthouse. And yet there they are again and again, they're showing up in court, not to fight for voting rights, not to fight against segregation. They're there to file, uh, con put contracts on file, put property deeds on file. Often they're there for divorce. And so there's this story that I think is fascinating and it's all over the records um, of the county courthouses all over the country. And there's much more to, to find there. Yeah, I love the you just hearing about the way you go about doing the uh, archival work because you know somebody who's done some history work myself it's always a, a challenging but also very rewarding part of the work is you know just just figure out how to do the sleuthing and unearth things and particularly when it involves things you know matters of day to day life that don't strike most people including most historians or many historians as um, you know momentous. And so you, you'd have to really do some work to unearth that. Um, and one of the themes of the book that I'd like to ask you about now has to do with the relationship between day-to-day, -day, these day-to-day -day struggles, because that's what the book's really about and, and um, brings those day-to-day -day struggles alive where um, the the day-to-day the -day lives of Black people come up against some legal issue. Um, but that, the relationship between that and... Um, and the, the 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 freedom struggle, um, which comes through in various surprising ways. So you write about the role of black institutions. You know, early in the book, you wrote about the black church and other black associations and the right to association that comes um, and that black people begin to enjoy after um, Reconstruction and the Reconstruction Amendment. So you know, that turns out to be an important civil right. Um, but then later in the book, you also have a chapter called um, Civil Rights Inc. Incorporated, where it's all about the, um, the the use of incorporation and the corporate form in the civil rights struggle. So, I mean, just tell us a little bit about that, because I think that makes the link between your day to day life and um, and the kinds of use of the legal system and the use of institutions that was necessary in order to make the civil rights struggle a success? No, I think that's a great question. Um, so I think we all know about Rosa Parks. She mm -hmm. sat down on a bus. Um, and I think we all know that that sparked a boycott in Montgomery, Alabama that lasted for more than a year and catapulted Martin Luther King uh, to the forefront of what became the civil rights movement. Mm 
there was an organization that was the driving force behind that boycott. It's called the Montgomery Improvement Association. And that organization uh, was incorporated about one third of the way through the boycott. Martin Luther King was uh, on the, the incorporation papers. Uh, it had a domicile in, in, in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and that incorporation allowed the MIA to do some pretty important things. So that gave it the legal power to bring in money, to collect money, donations from all over the world, mm -hmm. and to hold it legally. So they had a bank account, right? Um, and then it gave them the legal authority to disburse that money. So that famous carpool that they ran to keep mm -hmm. things going, somebody had to buy the gas, somebody had to keep the cars in good repair, the MIA's corporate powers helped them do that. And then probably just as important as those two things is it concentrated power. So the MIA had a, a a president and a board of directors. King was the president, and then it had this 10-member board of directors. And they were legally empowered to act in the name of the MIA Corporation. So that meant that members would give in their money, but then they no longer had a direct say. They couldn't tell King, no, you can't spend the money there. You can't direct it to go there. Um, the power to decide what the organization was going to do was concentrated. Now, you might think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think we can probably agree that it turned out to be a pretty effective thing to do. Mm -hmm. That's what enabled the MIA to survive for 13 months of boycotting, survive attacks by angry white citizens, lawsuits, legal attacks by hostile white officials. It's that incorporation that allowed them to do it. Contrast that with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, whose leaders declared over and over again that not only were they not a corporation, right, but they're not a democracy either. They're a movement, right? Mm -hmm. They said, we're not a labor union. We, we, we're a movement. And, you know, we try to empower the grassroots. And so over and over again, they would try to empower the grassroots. The grassroots, it turns out, the local grassroots, the people they were trying to organize, these folk heroes who they were trying to empower, many of them were pleading with them to concentrate leadership. In mm -hmm. effect, they, they thought that they needed not only democracy, but they needed... Um, a central authority, the kind of authority that would have that would have come with a corporation. SNCC folded after seven years. Mm -hmm. um, it folded for a variety of reasons, um, but I think that one reason the MIA, in fact, still exists today and SNCC does not, has to do with the power of incorporation, and that's a story that goes way back, yeah. way back to the seventeen the 1790s, almost as long as the corporation has existed in American law. Some of the very first corporations in America were black churches. And that, so that's a story that I think is really worth telling. It's a story about how, how black people planted the seeds for a movement that takes shape over time um, and culminates in this freedom struggle of the 1960s and 70s. Um, but it's also a story about power inside the organization. And there again, you have this story about black patriarchy because these corporations tend to be led by men. And at least in the case of black churches, their members tend to be overwhelmingly black women. And so you have a situation mm -hmm. where most of the work and most of the money is being invested by people who do not and cannot hold leadership roles mm. and who therefore have privileges, but not rights. Mm. And that distinction, you remember we were talking earlier yeah. about slavery, 
it's a similar kind of thing. They, over and over again, they try to get judges, courts to listen to them and say, look, we actually, we think that we have rights in our church. And over and over again, the, the courts say, no, not really. No, you don't. The, the rights to this church belong to its leaders as laid down in your book of discipline. And the leaders are almost always men. Hmm. So we have that same story. And, so, I, I, and one of the things that comes through so clearly, and of course it would when one thinks about the project that you're engaged in, is that there are heroic stories, there are humorous stories, and there are also some disturbing stories about the way Black people use the law or um, navigated the legal system. And the story of patriarchy is one of the most consistent, disturbing stories. Uh, so we see it in, now we see it in the corporate, um, the, the use of incorporation, as well as in um, family, marriage, and divorce. You know, another disturbing story that came about, and you kind of referred to it when we talked about divorce, was the use of stereotypes. Because you described the, the woman who wouldn't go to court because she was afraid that she would be subject to these awful stereotypes about the licentious Black woman. But, of course, the person who was going to be subjecting her to that was her own ex-husband. And you also talked about some cases where Black plaintiffs would kind of play on racial stereotypes in order to get a favorable outcome in a contract dispute, like the ignorant Negro defense that you mentioned. No, absolutely. And, and I think this is another classic example of interest convergence. Hmm. You know, here's here's a situation where white people, uh, you know, they have an interest in seeing racial stereotypes borne out. And so they're perfectly happy to see Black people come into court and play off this. So what you're talking about here is situations where a Black person makes a contract, makes a promise to a white person to perform something in the future. And then the white person sues to enforce it. So often it's about selling land. Um, white person gets a promise from a black person to, to sell him land. And then the black person comes back and says, well, you know, I signed a piece of paper, but I didn't think it was a sale deed. I didn't think I was promising to sell my farm. I thought that I was borrowing money. I thought I was signing a, signing a deed of trust. And so over and over again, you see them come into court and say this. And one of the ways that they make this argument in front of white judges is they claim that they the reason they didn't understand what the contract really said is because they are too ignorant essentially too black to understand anything about law. Mm -hmm. And the judges are kind of receptive to this and they'll listen to it. And sometimes they actually let the black person out of the contract and the black person gets to keep her house or her farm. And then what happens on the other side is these white plaintiffs who are trying to enforce the contract, they come along and they say, whoa, 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 whoa hold on. No, this is a very smart Negro. <laughs> This is, in fact, the smartest N-word I've ever met. That's a quote. Hmm. Um, he's so smart, it's <laughs> been hard for me, the, the white man, to keep up with him. Um, and this is in Mississippi hmm. in 1903. So there's this kind of odd kind of role reversal hmm. where a Black person is claiming to be ignorant, playing on stereotypes, and then a white person is saying, you're actually really smart. But where the interest conversions comes in is that the white person very carefully never says that black people in general are smart. Mm. What they're saying is that this particular black man was smart enough to have signed the contract knowingly and therefore the judge should hold him to it. So what I find really interesting, and I know, you know we're, we're both in law schools and we both know something about how uh, law gets taught today to, to students in law schools, Today, in first-year contracts, there is a, a case book that every student's going to buy. The professor will assign some case book, and they'll go through, and they'll read it. And by the end, they will come away with the impression that Black people are nowhere to be found in contract law. 
that contract law is essentially a domain of white people and especially white corporations. Mm -hmm. What they don't know is that there are actually a handful of cases involving black people scattered around the case book. The only one that they know involves a black person is Williams versus Walker Thomas Furniture, which is about unconscionability, where a black woman is uh, pulled into a predatory contract, like this furniture company sells her a bunch of stuff, like radio furniture and things like that, on the installment plan. And then as soon as she misses one payment, it takes back everything that they sold her, and then they keep all the principal payments that mm -hmm. she had paid in. And so the question for the court is, is that unconscionable? Should we enforce that contract? The same arguments come out. She claims, and through her lawyers, I was too ignorant. I didn't know. Now, the, the lawyers never actually used the words, she was an ignorant Negro. Instead, and these are white liberal lawyers, you know, they're working for legal aid in Washington, D.C. Instead, what they do is they pepper her, they pepper their brief, they pepper their argument with references that everyone in 1965 in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. would have understood right off the bat as indicating a Black person. So they said she is on public assistance. She's on welfare. They said she has several children. They said she lives in this neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Everybody knows it. Law students today know right away, even though the case doesn't actually say that she's Black, people know that she's Black. So this ignorant Negro defense persists through 1965. It persists in today's case books. And it leaves us with this impression that Black people only engage with law in these specialized areas. One of them is in contract. It's the law of unconscionability, just this tiny little area of contract law. And then Black people, if they're going to come up in law school at all, it'll be in constitutional law or in criminal law. But they're really... They're, I, they're everywhere in law. And that's, that's a really interesting story. And I think it can change the way that we, that we teach in law schools and it can change the way that we see African-American history. Yeah, that's a great place to kind of round out our discussion and maybe turn to some questions because the, I mean, if that's the theme that really runs through this, that we've got a narrative about the civil rights struggle, um, which is by and large a very accurate narrative and a very important one. But one of the things that it tends to suggest wrongly is law was always a hostile source for uh, or a, a hostile place for African Americans. It was something that they were alienated from. It was something that they didn't know about. And so, um, a, and, and the civil rights movement was you know, almost the first time that Black people could really engage with the law uh, as um, as equals and as active agents in their own lives. And your history just shows that it couldn't be further from the truth. And that in a variety of ways, whether through formal legal mechanisms, through contracts, through the corporate form, or through informal mechanisms in which the law was still effectively in operation in the same way that it is for all of us when we don't have to go to court to, to sue for something. Uh, Black people were always using the law, you know, for good things and for bad, um, for, you know, to fight against unjust uh, white supremacy, but also to defend patriarchy, because of course, that's part of the society. And it really does justice to the full and rich lives of African-Americans and of course, the civil rights struggle is a huge part of that. And of course, the fight against uh, racial hierarchy is a huge part of that. It's always part of the issue. But there's so much more to it as well. It's one of the, um, that, that is um, the enormous contribution of this book. So appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed reading the book and it's been great to talk to you. Maybe we can turn to some questions from the um, from, from the audience because I could see the chat kind of lighting up every once in a while as we were talking. Um, yeah, so we have um, a statement from uh, Nicole. Thank you so much for this exciting conversation. 
Uh, Professor Penningroth, I wondered if you could speak a bit about whether and if so, how the Great Migration affected Black litigation in the South. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So it, it affected Great Migration. The Great Migration affected litigation in the South in a bunch of different ways. I'm just going to point to one um, because it actually affects it, it allows me to bring in the story of my family, which I do from time to time. Um, when Black people, well, let me just say, when my great uncle Tom left Virginia in 1927 and moved north to New Jersey, he, uh, uh, you know, moved north with, uh, first by himself, and then he was followed by his wife, uh, Annie Holcomb. And then a whole bunch of other family members of the Holcombs and Reeves moved north. So he um, he and Annie fellowshiped in a church up north. Um, but uh, and and they they had an apartment they rented, but they would always go back south for visits. Uh, often it would be family reunions or funerals. And then the other thing that they did is they sent money south. And the reason that they were sending money south is because they intended to move back when they were old. He wanted to retire there and live next to his best friend and his uh, his brother-in-law down in Cumberland, Virginia. What that tells me is that Black people were maintaining their ties to the South. And I think we all kind of know that intuitively because of music, like the blues, um, uh, yeah, there are all sorts of ways that Southern African-American cultural markers get moved up to the North and then slosh back and forth between the South and the North. Um, you know, this is partly what gives us the modern musical world that we live in today, the world of hip hop. You know, it comes essentially out of the South. It's like sort of the children of people and grandchildren of people who moved to LA from Mississippi, who moved to Chicago and New York from, uh, from Georgia. <clears throat> but the other thing that's happening, it's not just a cultural connection, it's property. People are maintaining their interests in property over distance. They have an interest in a farm back home if they're landowners or they have an interest in a church back home in Alabama or Georgia, and they want to know who's sitting in their pew. And um, sometimes they, you know, they wind up making uh, legal arguments about this. And then the last way in which um, there's a story about law affected by the Great Migration is through the story of divorce. Because I, I realized that a, a significant number of the people who show up in the divorce records, they have a, a spouse who's absent because they're gone to New Jersey. They're gone north. And one spouse got left behind, maybe expected to follow or vice versa. There's a spouse in New Jersey who maybe expected someone down south to follow them north, but didn't. And so you can see in the, the divorce files, you can often see testimony about people with these expectations being shattered. And it's very painful, it's very moving sometimes to read this, people telling mm -hmm. stories about how they expected someone to move north with them and how heartbroken they were when that did not happen. So there are these different ways in which property and contract thread through the story of the great migration. They both enable it, um, and then they also uh, form part of the backdrop for how Black people negotiate what a family is uh, and, and what it's going to mean going forward. E. Stevens uh, asks, how would you like to see contract law taught today? What would the table of content look like? <laughs> well, that question I can't answer. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a, a, a comprehensive answer for how contract law should ideally be taught, but I can say some things about how contract uh, law teachers 
if they want to incorporate race into their teaching, as I think many of them do, I have some suggestions for how that could be done. And I think the starting point has to be not just that you need to uh, bring in racial angles to uh, cases and doctrines that are understood to be about race, mm -hmm. like unconscionability, you can also do it in areas of law that are not understood to be about race or about black people at all. And indeed, there are some cases that are already in the case books that involve black people, but they're just not marked that way. And there are others that could function as substitutes if one wanted to do that. You could plug them in and you could teach certain doctrines using that case instead of a case about say, uh, you know, a novel, a white novelist uh, writing about the suburbs in the 1950s, you know, case, cases like that. You could, there are, there are different cases that you could put in. So I think that's kind of where it has to begin. And I think the, the, the takeaway has to be that race is an important part of contract law, always has been, and it currently is, and probably will be for a long time it's not peripheral it's not tacked on it's not something that you're doing instead of teaching real contract law that is real contract law that's what you have to learn uh professor ford do, do you have any uh, additional thoughts or questions we're still waiting for a few more questions to come through i think we might have time for one more question after this but uh if you would oh. Okay, well, I see one way up in the queue that says, does the fact that the Constitution values property over human rights come into play in this story? And I wonder, I, I could imagine a way that it does. So now that that's a that's a really great question. And it, it it kind of reminds me a little bit of some of the things that um SNCC activists mm -hmm. said in the 1960s. And I think I think that that tension is real. It exists. Obviously, enslaved people were property. Um, and after the Civil War ends, there are a lot of white landowners who clearly wish that they could continue to treat uh, Black people as property. Um, I said earlier that there's this Black patriarchy that takes hold uh, after the 1860s. And it's pretty clear that there are black men in the south who you know out of necessity they need to mobilize labor they begin to treat their children in a way kind of like property they have rights in their children and the law enables them to do that so i guess um i think that there's certainly a tension between the struggle for freedom and the reality of property law uh, but that struggle sort of unfolds in unpredictable ways. Um, if Black men, through treating wives and children as property, manage to accumulate land, you know, if that, that is in fact the, the sort of source, that's the reason that uh, African Americans become landowners in the South. There's 15 million acres of land held by African-Americans, owned by African-Americans in 1910, in the worst years of Jim Crow. That's when African-Americans owned the most land. And it's the, the, the way that they were able to do that is through this ferocious determination, constant work, and uh, it, it's it, it's built in large part on this patriarchy, the idea that black men literally have a form of property in their children and in their wives. So there's a real there, there's a tension, but it's not necessarily the one that that we might expect. Professor Ford, any any thoughts, closing thoughts? Um, I my closing thoughts are simply that this book gives us a, a really distinctive and new way into thinking about the relationship between law and popular culture, day-to-day -day life. Um, and so it fits within, I, I think, a, a, a 
a, a, a new and welcome trend in history where we look at the day-to-day -day lives of of average people as well as the heroic um, political movements. And it, it, it's a really welcome and important addition to the way we think about the relationship between race and law. Um, and I'd recommend it to everybody. And um, I thanks again, Dylan, for writing it and for um, thinking of me to have this conversation with you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Well, I would like to thank the both of you for this really fascinating, I mean, very compelling discussion. And I think it's it's kind of opened up the way, too, for, you know, younger scholars to to maybe, you know, do more research even. And, and, and so thank you, Professor Penningroth, uh, really for this great, great service. Um, and Professor Ford, thank you for doing the honors tonight. Really appreciate that. Um, and thanks to all of you in the audience. You helped complete the circle, as always. Today's event has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through public events like this one, our publishing program, and educational outreach, all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So goodbye, everyone. Please take care. We hope to see you soon. <laughs>